Hey Mark, hey Taylor, hey Chris Ramey, Mom, everybody else, I'm Jeff, and on this episode of the Jarfcast DIY, we're going to go over what I've been up to for the past few weeks. It's quite a lot, so let's get into it. First, I'm still alive, uh, but it's been a very busy month. I've been up to quite a bit of things, so I made a dice tower for my brother Taylor, a dry box for printing flexibles, I've upgraded my prototyping board and my 3D printer. Definitely stay tuned for the update about the prototyping board. It's really good. I promise you'll want to see it. First, let's talk about my dry box. So, isn't that nice? I love it. Uh, I went with kind of a smaller box because I'm just kind of starting my experiments with flexibles and more hydroscopic materials. So I, I wasn't sure that I needed a whole lot of space and these Tupperware boxes kind of get really expensive the bigger they are. So because I'm only planning on having maybe a roll and a spare possibly on hand at any given time, I went ahead and went with a small box for like one to two spools tops. All right, so these are actually pretty easily made. Uh, first, you start out with a large-ish Tupperware. And you'll want one that's got a gasket around to seal up the lid. Now that's important to keep out moisture. And then you're gonna dump in a bunch of desiccant. I went with the Amazon special dry and dry, uh, orange indicating silica gel, which is really nice because when it does absorb moisture, it will change color. And I had a couple of beads that got stuck to uh, my first version of the spool holder and they turned kind of bluish green, which is a nice contrasting color to the orange. And so you'll know when it starts to turn bluish green that it's time to kind of dump it out on a baking sheet and throw it in the oven for a couple of hours. And even comes with instructions on how to reactivate the silica gel, the moisture absorbing properties of that on the back here. Next I needed to attach this pneumatic hose connector in the one face of the box. Uh, we want kind of one of the narrow faces so that the spool can sit and feed out that way. I started with a drill bit that I knew was smaller than the threads and I just kept increasing size until I found that there was just enough clearance for the threads to find purchase in the plastic of the box. And now it's going to make a nice airtight seal where I don't have to worry about moisture seeping in. And I also created this little plug out of some leftover PTFE tube and a little M2 bolt dropped in like that, which uh, maybe isn't super 100% great, but I don't know. The silica beads are still orange, so no problem so far. Now lastly, I needed a way to support the spool inside of the box. I thought maybe I could hang the spools, but I didn't want to get into it with my hot glue gun and all that. I thought maybe it would be easier just to find a freestanding spool holder. And that's exactly what I did. I found this on Thingiverse. It's called the Expandable Spool Holder, and it's designed by Chuank, Chuank, Chank? I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but link in the way down under. It included the SCAD code, which was used to model the holder, and it had some really nice, easy to change variables for the important bits, like the diameter of the spool you wanted to have, what sort of hole size did you want to leave for your rod that's going to hold the spool. And that was extremely helpful, and I absolutely love it when makers put the original design files in with the models. It really helps out and it allows for that flexibility to really make it for the application I need rather than printing it, reverse engineering it, and then making the measurements fit my needs. And you can see in here as a, a holder for the spool, I used a piece of half inch dowel that I had laying around. I bought this forever ago just on a whim thinking I might use it for spool holders and it's come in very handy for multiple types of spool holders. Uh, this one and the one I've got hanging above my printer wall mounted. And it's also come in handy as uh, mechanical reinforcements for other prints that I wanted to break apart and then hold together. And so I use that as a dowel. So I'm not gonna go real deep into why you need a dry box for this type of material because Thompson Lottery already did that video over here. In short, the filament absorbs water. Filament like this uh, Filamentum Flex Fill will hold water and when you go to print it 
pop like popcorn coming out the extruder, which uh, sounds delicious, but really it's just gonna make for a super messy print bed and a terrible finished print, if it finishes at all. All right, so once it's all put together, pull out the plug and connect this end of the TTFE tube into the pneumatic connector. Then I'll run this up to the printer, up to the top of the extruder. Now, I could have put another one of these pneumatic connectors in the top of the printer, maybe, um, but I didn't really feel like I needed to, A, because the extruder body is already open and, you know, allows air into it, so what's the per point? It's just going to ensure that this doesn't really backslide, but it doesn't do that anyway because the tension of pulling the filament through the tube keeps this pretty well butted up on top of the extruder anyways. Next, I made a dice tower with slash for my brother Taylor while he was here visiting. Uh, we were going to make more things, but we kind of got distracted with booze and card games and, well, also I didn't have the tools that I needed to make the picture frame that I wanted to help with, so that kind of went by the wayside. But we did make him a dice tower. Now I showed up to D&D &D one night with this dice tower and everybody immediately fell in love with it. So now every time I show it to anybody who plays D&D, they absolutely have to have one. You can get yours on Thingiverse. It's called Brick Dice Tower with wooden fold up drawbridges and it's made by 3D Central VA. Thank you 3D Central VA for coming up with a name I can actually pronounce. And that link is also gonna be down in the way it under. Um, so check it out there and print your own. It is a bit demanding with these little bitty features that uh, can come out with quite a bit of ringing, but just knock down the speed on your printer and it'll come out looking fabulous. I love it. It's a hit every time I use it. And this is a remix of a remix of a remix. So for all of the attributions going back to the original creator, check out the link in the description and follow the sources all the way back on Thingiverse. So as I was saying, I made this as a souvenir for my brother, although I think he's gonna go home and sell it. To see his visit, check out this link up in the corner, 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 who knows. Um, I made a little short video detailing uh, picking him up at the airport and then his reaction to the dice tower, his thoughts on how it's held together, etc, etc. If it doesn't exist just yet, check back in a week or two. It's been a lot of craziness here, so uh, it might take me a little while to get it put together. But I'll also put that link in the way down under. So I use a Prusa i3 Mark III for my physical model prototyping and they recently published a huge summer update on their blog. I uh, went, of course I read it right away. I uh, was hugely excited to see that they had upgrades to both the extruder body for improved cooling around the heatsink, as well as an improved part cooling fan shroud, which holds the fan now at an angle instead of right up and down, which allows a little bit more air to flow around the part. Now, I was so excited to see that, that I went about printing it, all the pits out <laughs> right away. So excited, in fact, that when I went to install them, I did maybe sorta kinda break the X carriage. Uh, so here's the one that I've printed as a backup. It so far doesn't seem to be doing much damage, so I'm gonna wait until my next maintenance on the printer to actually install it, but I've got it. Um, and you know what? I also did break uh, two fan shrouds. First one I broke was the one that uh, was being installed as a replacement. The other one that I broke was the one being replaced. Luckily for me, I did have my original part cooling fan, which was uh, only slightly broken from the meltdown. Uh, now the meltdown is something that I did do to my printer uh, within the first week of owning it. I printed with some PETG. Uh, in a room that went from very toasty to very cold in a short amount of time. The edges of that print peeled up and stuck to the hot end, and by the end of it, it was just, when I woke up the next morning, a humongous blob of PETG, or as I like to call it, PETG, uh, just completely fused to the extruder. <laughs> Uh, I did have to call Prusa and get a bunch of replacement parts for that, and I was out of commission for like two weeks. Live and learn. Now as for the cooling shroud, even if I didn't have the original, I would probably be okay because the shroud is printed in ABS. Specifically, it's the only part on the i3 Mark III that they recommend 
always, always, always use ABS on just because it's down there, whoop, down there with the hot end with all the melted plastic. You definitely want to make sure you're using the plastic with the highest uh, thermal tolerance whenever you're in that area. Um, but the good thing about ABS is you don't need a cooling fan to print with it. So had I been completely out of luck on the fan shroud, I still could have uh, just printed myself a new fan shroud without a fan shroud. How cool is that? So as soon as I went about getting all the replacement parts printed and installed, I set my sights on making some benchies. Well, just a benchie. Uh, this is the Benchy that I made after upgrading the printer, it's in the Hatchbox Red. This is one that I had made several months prior in Hatchbox Black. And this is some orange PETG, I think also Hatchbox. Um, both of these PLA. And I don't know if it's the slicer settings or if it's the improved cooling or what it is about um, the way that this one printed, but it looks gorgeous. I've found only one flaw in the surface. Um, even the bottom first layer test came out beautifully compared to every other Benchy I've made. So maybe I just did a really good job of uh, getting it put back together this time. Oh, there's still too much ringing to quite make out the hashtag 3D Benchy, but it did come out a lot cleaner than it did on my other um, PLA print. And then most interestingly of all, let's see if it exists. No, that's too rough to really tell. There's this spot here where it's ever just so slightly not quite smooth. And it's on my PETG print as well. So I'm not sure if it's maybe overcooling or if it's in the model itself or what the issue is there. I don't know. Leave me a comment if you want me to investigate that further, and I'll be happy to, but at the moment I don't have any plans on figuring out why exactly that is printing with that slight, slight, slight deviation, and only on the side that's actually facing the print cooling fan. On the other side, it's much, much less pronounced. So overall, I'm very happy with the results I'm getting from this upgrade. And it's really, really nice that Prusa puts up the model files online so I don't have to order upgraded parts from them. I can just make them myself. I think the angled print cooling fan has this wonderful jank quality to it that really fits in with my whole aesthetic. Um, and it doesn't impede the usability in any way. It's not sticking out in such a way that it's gonna run into anything. It's just quite nice. Uh, the Dyson inspired slot in the extruder looks classy as sure. and should improve overall printing performance, I guess, so they say. Now my only concern is the tightening of the clearances within the extruder body as I've got some issues unloading filament now. Let me demonstrate. Okay, so my printer is currently loaded with this red hatchbox PLA which seems to be giving me the most trouble and it's preheating at the moment so we're up to about 150 degrees Celsius. Wait for that to finish and then I'll unload the filament and we'll take a look and see what happens. Okay, so we're up to 210. So let's uh, actually wait. Yeah. Go in here and unload filament and watch what happens. Okay, so it's just beeped. Now I'm going to pull up and uh oh. Oh crap, it's not coming out. Rats. So now I've got to go back into the menus, disable automatic load, settings, filament auto load off. And it's time to open up the extruder body. All right, so now the extruder body is open. I'm gonna reach in here, try to push out the filament. Let's see. Wow. Getting in there with this. Where are you? I can't see. There we go. Alright. You can see here. Can you see there? Yeah, there's a little bit of blob right here 
I'm gonna have to cut that off before I can pull out the filament. All right, now can that be avoided? Yes, it can. Let's clear my print bed before I load up any new spool or any filament. <clears throat> okay, ready to load. There it goes. See it come out the bottom. There it goes. So what I believe is happening is the extruder is unloading and the plastic coming out still a little bit hot. And when it comes up to the top, the extruder gears are creating that little bubble. So if I hit unload and I pull up immediately, as soon, yeah, so that's very stringy. That's very molten still. So that's gotta be what's happening is it's coming up. And as soon as those teeth let go, if I pull it out, it'll come out. But if I don't, those teeth are going to create a little ball at the end of this that makes it impossible to get out of the extruder, which is not ideal, but it's workable. Okay, now finally on to the bit that I am most excited about. The official JARFCAST prototyping board. <laughs> Not only have I finally created all of the mounting hardware for the modules, I have improved the way that they interface with the board. So originally I had these sort of cuts on top and I was going to print where there would be like rails that would slide and you'd you know, be able to manipulate sort of with infinite up and down distance here where they would sit on the board and I thought that was great until I dropped in these so this was the original sort of middle support and they were super flimsy as a matter of fact one of them has already broken that's let go totally and it really wasn't gonna work great so <clears throat> what I've done is I've gone back to the drawing board and I've created these sort of drop-in rails where you can print the features on their sides rather than straight up and down, which I knew was going to cause problems with unsupported overhangs. And it works fabulously. I've also printed out these sort of um, bay covers so that you don't just see all the exposed wiring and lever nuts underneath. Um, I've got everything wired up to accept a, well, the Anderson power poles going out from the power supply. And then from there I connect one of these barrel jack connectors because it seems that all of these bits run with a barrel jack connector with the exception of the variable power supply. Here I've got the buck converter wired with screw nuts, um, screw terminals, which I will be terminating the wires, like a DuPont wire kind of, uh, so that those are a little bit more secure. But yeah, of course I wanted to ditch the idea of the feature printing on bottom because those overhangs, as I found out the hard way with a lot of these pieces where you've got the bridging underneath, that material likes to sag a lot. And it took me at least an hour per piece that's got that feature uh, to cut away all of that drooping material with my hobby knife and a set of mini files. It was just a disaster and hugely messy. I've still got bits of plastic sticking me in the feet when I walk around this room. No amount of vacuuming I think is ever going to get all of that plastic out of my carpet. So as far as designing the actual cases for these modules goes, um, I got lucky on two of the pieces. They were already using these acrylic laser cut bottoms and so what I was able to do is just copy the dimensions, uh, do it up in CAD and print out some, uh, let me see if I've still got one, print out a test piece to make sure it works and then expand it to fill the space needed to drop it in. And so that would be for the function generator and for the var variable power supply here. Now the buck converter was super easy because all I had to do was match up the screws footprint. Easy, easy, easy. This guy wasn't too bad. All I had to do was make sure I had the length, width, and height correct, measure on these faces where I needed to put some holes for the connectors. Not too bad. That only took me about three iterations. Now this guy on the other hand, this parts tester, was a pain because it's got all of these little features that you need to be able to access on top and bottom. I wanted to give this a nice cover on it, which might have been a little bit ambitious because now I've got all of these weird dimensions that 
just don't really work together in the CAD drawing that I've got. I've done it twice, um, trying to reconstrain everything so that it will allow me to make much easier updates and it just hasn't worked. I've still got areas where I have to like click and drag a line because whenever I try to insert a dimension, it calls it over constrained and fails. So I'm not sure what's going on there, but with a little bit more experience using the CAD tools that I'm using uh, at the moment, Fusion 360, I should be a little bit better. And the case wasn't too bad, but again, you've got a lot of different features that uh, I wasn't quite sure how to dimension the first time around because this was the first one that I did. I made a few standalone boxes for this parts tester because I used the parts tester to test the parts for everything that was hand built, uh, which is the scope and the function generator and the parts tester itself all came as kits that you had to solder together. Um, with the scope, I may end up doing a lid for it at some point. It does look not good. Uh, the way it is now, but it's also going to be a lot of work trying to work with uh, the different heights that some of these are at, because the screen, of course, is a lot more, uh, has a lot more height from the board than like the switches and buttons. We'll see. It's a rainy day project, I suppose. But it's working, and that's what I wanted. It's great. Um, now, I'm already getting ideas for second uh, iteration. Well, it's not really second iteration. I'm already getting ideas for the Mark II version of this. Uh, the first thing I noticed was that this breadboard straight down the middle, I don't quite like it. It's a bit nasty. And I think that maybe smaller breadboard modules that I could drop in would be a lot more handy because then, A, I could keep a project on a breadboard and swap it out as I work on it or want to work on something else as opposed to this where it's kind of an all or nothing thing. If I wanted to swap anything out here, I'd have to drop in a full new middle module and that's not really very nice for a workbench. Um, and then I think what I'll do is I'll split the difference in the width of these bays. So the center and one of the sides. So I can have some of the, you know, more narrow modules drop in here and here with the wider modules still fitting in the wide side because I don't want to have to redesign, you know, my scope case and my power supply here to fit a new set of dimensions but I'd be happy to reprint these a little bit narrower or just leave them the way they are and fill up the wide side and then have the slightly narrower side available for all sorts of breadboards or whatever else I come up with. Who knows? But anyway, that's sort of the beauty of this rapid prototyping process. Uh, like, you know, the tool I made here in this prototyping board or with a 3D printer, you can, if you design it right, swap out new ideas for old ones fairly easily. And this would be a really easy upgrade to do with this board. All I'd need to do is modify some of the top cuts on these two plates, print new ones of those, slot them in, good to go. But let me know uh, down in the comments if you think that this is something that interests or excites you. And who knows, maybe I'll, I'll go ahead and publish those design files and make that completely an open source project for the community to drive. Whew. That was quite an update. I hope you stuck around to the end because this is the part where I ask you to go down there and smash that like button. Uh, also, if you really enjoyed this and you wanna see more, subscribe to the channel. And if you wanna be the first to know when I put out a new video on one of my DIY projects, go ahead and ring that bell. If you want to engage with us and help shape the future of our DIY, like my friend uh, Chris Ramey with the laugh of a child that always puts a smile on my face did, Go on down to the comments section and tell us what you want to see. Did you catch my box joke, Chris? That one was for you.